Hi there. I think we're going to start. Okay. So, and thank you for coming. Um, and I am very happy to introduce to you Carrie Perloff, who is a titan of the American theater or the international theater or whatever. So, a playwright, a director, an educator for over 25 years, the director of the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. Um, and uh, as part of the many things she has done, um, she has had um, close connections with many of the great um, playwrights of our time. And she has just written a book about her work with Harold Pinter and Tom Stoppard. And she is going to tell us about it. And um, feel free to ask questions when it is over. Or during. Or during. <laughs> <laughs> and it is my pleasure to introduce to you Carrie Perloff. Okay. Um, yeah, you can you can weave your way in however you wish. But David Lang and I go back to uh, and Gandhi to our undergraduate years together uh, at Stanford. So it's so when David asks, I always say yes because we've made a lot of plays together but not scores for Pinter or Stoppard because they don't really require it in the same way. So I thought I would just talk to you a little bit about um, the rehearsal experiences and the sort of discoveries I made over many, many years in my directing career with these two playwrights, Harold Pinter and Tom Stoppard, who were completely seminal in my thinking and my, and my kind of creative life. And, um, and I realized thinking about it that most people actually don't even know what a director does. I am asked all the time, you know, uh, we, I, we get the acting part, we get the design, we understand the writing and, and what exactly is it that happens? Um, you know, and, and the director is the person, who, like a conductor in a, in a symphony who sculpts the event um, in the way that feels truest to the voice of the originating artist, in this case, the playwright. So the real gift, and it isn't always a gift, there are playwrights who are a nightmare to have in the room, but the real gift of having a playwright in the room when you're making a production of his or her work is that it's a shortcut to discovering what the voice of the play actually is. And I think that's the hardest thing about directing. And what I mean by that is, you know, you can read a lot of work of any given writer and you have to sort of put your ear to the ground and try to figure out what is the heartbeat? What makes this not literature on the page, but something that lives as a, as a kind of, um, uh, embodied theatrical uh, event or could live that way? And how do you bring it to life? So when you meet the playwright, you sort of watch them in action and you listen to them speak. Um, that voice emerges sort of weirdly instantaneously. Um, and you learn what I sort of call the rules of play about a given playwright. Harold Pinter and Tom Stoppard are totally different writers. So it's an odd thing to couple them, except I claimed it because I love them both and I worked with them both. They are not aesthetically, if you know their work, they're not aesthetically similar, right? Pinter is a minimalist. The work is always set in a room. He's with no nature that ever intervenes or, or, or um, interferes. Uh, usually very small casts, very, very poetic kind of tight language very uh, violent, very sexual, um, very uh, funny, mysterious, um, and short. Tom Stoppard, by contrast, is long. <laughs> the plays are three hours long. They take place, they're huge casts. They take place in imaginary universes all over the world, India, whatever, jumpers on the moon and somebody, you know, they're based on Heisenberg, they're based on chaos theory. He's a maximalist to Pinter's minimalism. Um, so in many ways you think, what is the rationale uh, for coupling these two writers? And the day COVID began, March 15th, 2020, lockdown in San Francisco, I was sitting, looking out the window this beautiful day and everything stopped. And there was this inchoate dread in the air that you couldn't see and nobody knew what the virus was. And it was like, a pin. I thought I just pulled Pinter off the shelf, which I usually do in moments of crisis, but it was like a Pinter play, that weird inchoate dread that happens when the knock on the door comes in Pinter and you think, who's on the other side of that door? And nothing is explained. And you know, as Beckett said about Joyce, it is not about the thing, it is the thing itself. This is true of Pinter. 
It is the thing. You know, it's not about menace. It is the most terrifying thing to work on or to do. So I started writing this book and I sent it to a publisher and I said, I'm coupling these two writers and um, here's my justification. And fortunately it was Bloomsbury Matthew and they're very open-minded. They said, great, do it and write it fast and we'll publish it in a year. So that's what happened. Um, but here's what I wanna to talk to you about today because this is what I kind of, um, it's not that I discovered it after the fact, but you know, when you've worked with a writer, with an artist, like I've worked with David 30 years, if I had to go back and parse what that was, I would pull out, which is what I did with all of my scripts from Stafford and Pinter, all of my correspondence, all of the emails, all of the letters, all of my transcriptions in my scripts of what they said in rehearsal, uh, you know, and I looked at it all and I thought, what story does this tell? And, you know, we lost Harold Pinter in 2008, so I couldn't uh, commune with him, but Tom Stoppard is very much alive and well. And, and I said to Tom, I don't even know that I have good enough notes that I remember this well enough because we were in rehearsal, right? I mean, I wasn't thinking in rehearsal, well, I'm going to write this down and write a book about it. And, and so he said, Carrie, in that with those rolled R's, I trust you implicitly, write what you like. I will read the sections about Harold. So he hasn't even ever read it. And I just saw him in London. So I hope what I'm saying is true. But here was the thing I want to talk to you about today. And then if you want to ask questions about rehearsal stuff, we can do that. I'm happy to do whatever you want to hear. But what I realized had over the years become profoundly important in my understanding of these two writers is that they are both Central European Jews. And this sounds ridiculous if you are thinking about the American theater where half of the profession are Central European Jews or Jews of some sort. But this was in, in the 50s and 60s when Pinter and Stoppard emerged on the scene. This was um, very unusual. And they so, and, I, and I, they were complete outsiders to the system. So I'm not gonna go into, I have a whole chapter in the book on the scene that they entered into, but if you sort of cast your mind back to, you know, Noel Coward, Terrence Radigan, J.B. Priestley, you know, that genre of playwright, right? Upper middle class plays about um, drawing room, romantic disasters, sometimes brilliant, I love Coward, um, but, but working class never appeared on the stage and certainly, um, the kind of themes, language, comedy, violence that enter the stage with Pinter and then with Stafford had never been seen. Uh, the paving stone was John Osborne's Look Back in Anger, not a great play, but at least a very loud play. So people thought, oh, something different's happening, right? So why is the Jewish thing important? I'll tell you the things that I learned. Um, and it started with the day that Pinter walked into the, I very young, I was running a theater in New York called the Classic Stage Company. And I um, had just had a baby who was 10 days old when Harold Pinter walked into my theater and we were rehearsing The Birthday Party, which is his first full length play with a new one act of his called Mountain Language. And he walked in and he makes no small talk and he has his baritone voice and he's exactly like his play is kind of sexy and terrifying. And, uh, and, but the good news is he drank a lot. So once you got to go out and have a drink, he kind of calmed down. And he was looking at the actress playing Lulu. And he kept saying, her name was Wendy McKenna. He kept saying, McKenna, McKenna, Scottish? She'd say, no. And then we keep drinking. Then he'd say, McKenna, McKenna, are you Irish? No. Well, of course it turned out her name was Wendy Rosenberg and she had changed her name and she was, you know, a nice Jewish girl. And so name changing, identity changing, passing, subterfuge, that is like his eyes lit up. And I thought, oh, that's what he immediately, he bonded with her. He knew who she was. So that's where I sort of started this, this thought of my own of what is the impact of Harold Pinter being Jewish? So here's the background in a nutshell, if you don't know. He was 12 years old when the war begins. And he is part of that group of children who are supposed to be sent out for the bombing of the Blitz, right? And he lives in Hackney. And you know that the Nazis were very aware, not only that the docks were on the east side of London, but the Jews were on the east side of London. So you could bomb the docks and bomb the Jews at the same time. And, and this was what was going on. And so he was sent 
away from his family. He was an only child raised in an Orthodox family. His grandparents were all from Odessa, non-English speaking. The mother was Moskowitz. The father was Pinter. He claimed he was a Portuguese Jew called Da Pinto, but that was discredited. And um, so Pinter grows up in this uh, quite ritualistic religious family. He has one wealthy relative. Um, uh, who, well, I lifted a whole thing that that relative said because it's exactly like the plays. His father is a tailor, a Jewish tailor in Hackney. Okay, so uh, Pinter is sent away during the war and he is miserable because like most good urban Jews, he hates the country, hates it, hates it, can't stand it, doesn't wanna see the trees, the landscape, anything, and goes back to London at the height of the blitz. So his childhood is incredibly fraught and dangerous and upsetting. And he had two great loves, girls and cricket. So the bombing would happen and he would grab his cricket bat and his latest love poem and go dive into the bomb shelter at the foot of their house. So he lived in this very violent, frightening uh, time in England. And as soon as the war is over, Mosley starts doing his brown shirt uh, fascist marches all over Hyde Park, but also the East End of London. So Pinter, and Pinter is very um, connected to the Jewish community, uh, goes to a school, um, the Hackney Boys School, but which is 70% Jewish, uh, falls in love with English literature, uh, um, very young, um, but also encounters an enormous amount of anti-Semitism and violence and learns to talk his way around things. Um, and then, uh, never goes to university, which is really interesting, as with Stoppard, these two brilliant intellectual erudite playwrights who are who never had university educations, which is also very unusual in British drama, certainly in the second wave of British playwrights. And Pinter starts writing. Uh, he's an actor first, right? And he's a great Shakespearean actor, and he goes touring in Ireland, and he brings home a shiksa to his family. Well, this was a disaster. The family is ready to excommunicate him. It's not unacceptable. So he goes back out on tour. He doesn't marry Pauline Flanagan, but then he does marry Vivian Merchant on Yom Kippur. And that's really kind of uh, uh, the knife. His family doesn't go and great trauma. And that story turns up in his greatest play, which is called The Homecoming, which is about a man who brings his disreputable wife uh, back into the heartbeat of the Jewish family. So he writes very intense family plays. And it's always funny to me that he's never written about as a Jewish playwright and they're not ever, they're not really done as Jewish plays. But if you look, I'll just tell you in a minute about the birthday party. The birthday party starts like a bad Jewish joke. It's a Jew and an Irishman walk into a bed set, except they're called Goldberg and McCann and they come to terrorize a man who is hiding upstairs, whose name is Stanley Weber who's also pro pro probably possibly Jewish, who's an artist, a pianist, who's hiding out. And they uh, terrorize him. But during the course of it, Goldberg gives these fabulous kind of um, very creepy, disturbing speeches um, in which he tries to insinuate himself into the family. So for example, uh, he stands up, he, they announce that it's Stanley's birthday, which it isn't, but it's a way to give him a party, break his glasses and break his mind. It's very frightening. And uh, Goldberg stands up as the terror is going on and he says, but tonight, Lulu McCann, we've known a great fortune. We've heard a lady extend the sum total of her devotion in all its pride, plume and peacock to a member of her own living race, Stanley. My heartfelt congratulations. I wish you on behalf of us all a happy birthday. I'm sure you've never been a prouder man than you are today, Mazel Tov, and may we only meet at Simcus. Now this is, nobody had heard this in the English theater before, you know, like, well, who is this man and what is he talking about? Um, and right after that wonderful, delightful speech, Meg, the ditzy uh, owner of the bed said, they go away and, and the interrogation of Stanley begins. And it is um, a terrifying expose of somebody in hiding that surely Pinter learned from his own childhood experience. And a little section that goes like this, Goldberg says, Weber, why did you change your name? Which is always the trigger, right? Stanley, I forgot the other one. Goldberg, what's your name now? Stanley, Joe Soap. Goldberg, you stink of sin. McCann, I can smell it. Goldberg, do you recognize an external force? Stanley, what? 
Goldberg, do you recognize an external force? McCann, that's the question. Goldberg, do you recognize an external force responsible for you, suffering for you? Stanley, it's late. Goldberg, late, late enough. When did you last pray? McCann, he's sweating. Goldberg, when did you last pray? McCann, he's sweating. Goldberg, is the number 846 possible or necessary? Stanley, neither. So it's a kind of horrifying subversion, um, this interrogation that tries to unmask a hidden person who is passing as something he's not. And, um, and this, when we did this scene with Pinter in the room in rehearsal, um, what I learned is, it's not abstract at all. When you go to graduate school in theater, it's, it's all done as a metaphor and everybody talks about these as theater of the absurd and it's all metaphoric about what, but, it's, but to Pinter, these were absolutely real people in absolutely specific, terrifying um, dialectical situations. Um, and that really fascinated me and, and clearly, and he talked a lot about his own experience um, with violence and with um, anti-Semitism and with and his growing up experience. And um, I had this conversation with him, which ended up in the book and Americans are gonna hate it, but I just kept it in for just this little reason. His contemporary in the American theater by about 10 years is Arthur Miller. So if you think about Arthur Miller, play like Death of a Salesman, right? That is also obviously Arthur Miller, working class Brooklyn Jew. It's based on his uncle Mo, who is the salesman. But when you read that play, it's completely deracinated, deliberately. So Miller writes in his biography that there's so much anti-Semitism, he doesn't want to add to it by writing Jewish characters. I think ultimately, it's why I always, I know this is so sacrosanct, but probably not in this place. I always thought Arthur Miller was sort of phony. Um, I, I've never directed a Miller play. I've never wanted to direct a Miller play. I know that's a terrible thing to say, but I find them um, inauthentic because really it's a Jewish family that's been renamed Happy and Biff and Linda, you know, and, and somehow the muscle of it feels, um, feels uh, undercut. Whereas with Pinter, what's so interesting, Pinter got in big trouble with, by, with the Jewish community, particularly with the Jewish playwright Stephen Burkhoff and also um, Arnold Wesker, the other two of that period, who said to him, Goldberg is so evil, how could you write such an evil character? And Pinter said, I'm not under any obligation to make Jews good, I'm under an obligation to make them present. Jews are gonna be in my plays because they are part of society and that's what I write and I'm not gonna pretend otherwise. Um, this comes up over and over again in, in um, this coming of age thing, the name changing, he changed his name to David Barron to, as an actor. So he loved the fact that when he was um, in his own play, The Homecoming, it said, uh, David Barron starring in The Homecoming by Harold Pinter. So that weird subterfuge he always thought was really hilarious. Lots of stuff that's Jewish music hall and comedy. Um, I won't read it all to you, but it's so brilliant. Um, the way he uses comedy, but also the way language is weaponized, um, the power of the name um, and name changing. Um, uh, marrying out of the faith and what happens when you bring somebody back into the fold who isn't part of it. Um, these things are, um, central to an understanding of how to make uh, his plays work. And once you understand that every encounter in a Pinter play is predator and prey, and the lines of demarcation, you know, he wrote out of opposition, Pinter. So you were either for him or against him. You are either part of the tribe or not part of the tribe. And so the kind of dialectic there, um, if you can find it on stage, and it's why staging Pinter is an exercise in economy because you can't put anything on stage that distracts from that essential choreography, right? So I'll talk about that later, but um, it's a kind of delicious thing to design and stage uh, because let's say it's just two people sitting if one of them rises, everything changes, right? The whole dynamic of the room, the power dynamic shifts. So you, like one of the rules of play in Pinter is you don't walk and talk at the same time. Language is active, physical speech is active, silence is active, use them. Don't muddy them, it's not naturalistic. It doesn't mean it's not realistic, but it's not naturalistic. It's quite different. Now, we'll talk about that later if you wanna hear it, but I just wanna, sort of uh, mirror this with my discoveries about Stoppard, because that is very different. So um, 
Tom Stoppard, everybody thinks of as the quintessential English playwright, right? He loves everything English, the parliamentary system, free press, the language, he loves the food, if you can believe it, and the landscape, and you know, and he, um, he fell for it hook, line, and sinker. But if you don't know this, his background is really fascinating. So he's born in 1939 in Zlin, Czechoslovakia, and his name is Tomasz Strassler. And his father is the surgeon at the Bata Shoe Factory. Um, and there's a, there are a number of Jewish doctors at this factory. And the, the Bata Corporation starts to realize that these Jews are in danger and that it's only a matter of time before uh, Hitler arrives in Czechoslovakia. And so they say to the family, we are going to evacuate you when the time comes and you can either go to Singapore or Uganda, because that's where they had Bata shoe factories or something. So the Stoppard family, the Strassler family chooses Singapore. So imagine this, this little boy, Tom is two years old, his brother Peter is four years old. The parents are in their 30s. One night they pack everything up and they leave Zlin and they go to Singapore. They're in Singapore for quite a while. The father volunteers and is on a gunboat that gets torpedoed by the Japanese, but they don't know that because the mother, Marta Strassler, is on a ship thinking she's escaping to Australia with the boys. The ship gets de rerouted to India. So Tom Stafford grows up in Darjeeling during the war and goes to an American missionary school, not a Raj school, but an American Methodist school. And that's how he learns English. And here's the thing, the very first time I ever met him, which was in 1994, when I began running ACT, I met him at the National Theater. And he walked in, and I was so nervous, you know, it's Tom Stoppard, and you have to be really on your game. And I looked at him and I thought, oh, I know you, he just felt like, my mother is Viennese, a Viennese refugee, he felt like everybody in my family, like he felt completely familiar to me. So I said to him, I told him, I said, oh, I was so nervous to meet you, but you feel so familiar to me. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, you're another Central European Jew. And he said, ah, it's complicated, he said to me. So he sort of knew he was Jewish, the way Madeleine Albright sort of knew she was Jewish and wondered, oh, why did my family all flee? In the 40s, yeah. So, but Tom never had dug into it. So here's where my reckoning with his past started. I was working on his first play, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead, which made him, you know, the, he famously was asked, what is it about Mr. Stoppard? And he said, it's about to make me very rich. And it did, and he was 29 years old. And that was the beginning of his career. But here's, I think it's one of the most heartbreaking plays. It is funny, but it's heartbreaking. So. He's four years old by this time in Darjeeling and his mother finds out the father has been killed. She doesn't dare tell him. So a friend takes him and his brother on a walk and says, your father's dead. But he hardly remembered his father and he didn't know what to think. And he describes standing there looking at this man thinking, I don't know what to say. Now listen to this. So this is from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. This is Guildenstern talking to the player king who's just stabbed himself and fallen on the ground to demonstrate death. And he says, no, 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 you've got it all wrong. You can't act death. The fact of it has nothing to do with seeing it happen. It's not gasps and blood and falling about. That isn't what makes it death. It's just a man failing to reappear. That's all. Now you see him, now you don't. That's the only thing that's real. Here one minute and gone the next and never coming back. An exit, unobtrusive and unannounced, a disappearance, gathering weight as it goes on until finally it is heavy with death. And I just thought that was so heartbreaking. That's the story of his father. That, that's how he died. That's how he went. So I started asking him a lot about his past. And um, it wasn't that he obfuscated. What was, what was so interesting to me is that his mother clearly had drawn a veil over it and did not want to talk about it. Now, you know, England's a very anti-Semitic country and it certainly was when he arrived there. And she married um, a colonel, very conservative guy, Stoppard, who basically said to her, you will never speak Czech again. You'll never say you're Jewish. You'll never talk about your past and we'll raise the boys as good English lads and he goes to an English public school and they want him to play rugby and everything and then the, the 
Stoppard is dismayed when he enters the theater, when Tom becomes a playwright, because he says that's just for poofters and queers. You know, that's what Stoppard was like. So you can imagine when Stoppard starts to kind of investigate his past, the family is not happy. And because he becomes famous so young, Kenneth Tynan writes a profile of him. That's what happens in England, you know, when you get famous. And he says to Stoppard, what about your history and your family? What happened to your family? Did they all get gassed? Like, where were your grandparents and your, and your, all your relatives? Have you ever gone back? Have you ever asked? So he goes, he says, I don't know. And his mother has a fit and says, we weren't really Jewish. Uh, it was just, you know, the Germans came in and dug around in people's ancestry. And so that's how it happened. But he then, so he pushes it away and pushes it away, but he clearly thinks about it all the time. So there are two things that come up in Stoppard's plays that I learned to look for immediately. And you have to find the spine in a Stoppard play because they are so erudite and full of jokes and full of stories and facts that if you don't have some thread to hold on to, the plays will just dissipate. You know what I mean? But the spine, it's always this sort of dialectic about identity. It's people with sort of two identities, just like Tom, who are trying to kind of navigate who they are and, and what to hold on to that make, that gives them a sense of themselves. And usually in Stoppard, the only thing they have to hold on to that gives them any sense of identity in some way is, is art or culture, you know? And so the theme running through is plays of the loss of culture, the burning of the books, the desecration of culture and what happens when culture is lost, that is an enormous thread of his plays, but also this kind of um, identity chaos, you know, that, that um, you never can quite uh, uh, pinpoint. I mean, it's not so much the naming and unnaming, like in, it's, it's that somebody's divided right um, down the line. So I'll give you an example of a play that you think has nothing to do with anything Jewish, and it doesn't. Um, but it's about identity. And because I knew Tom so well, by the time I directed Indian Inc. and he was with us in the room, I thought, oh, I see what this is. So this is um, Indian Inc. is a play. This is an, an older English woman and a young Indian painter who come together because this woman's sister had had an affair with that painter's father many, many years ago in India. And she's just trying to understand who he is. And she says, you're a painter like your father. And he says, oh, yes. Yes, I am a painter like my father, though not at all like my father, of course. And she says, your father was an Indian painter, you mean? And he says, an Indian painter. Well, I'm as Indian as he was, but yes, I suppose I am not a particularly Indian painter, not an Indian painter particularly, or rather, and she says helpfully, not particularly an Indian painter. And then he says, yes, but then nor was he, apart from being Indian. She says, as you are. He says, yes. And she says, though you're not at all like him. And he says, no, yes. My father was quite a different kind of artist, a portrait painter. So you see, and this is true in every play of Starboard, Hapgood, the characters divided right down the middle, these, these sort of dueling identities of people who just can't really figure out who they are. What am I doing on this earth? Which is my native language? Who do I relate to? Who, who, what is my origin story? Um, that's something that um, uh, I learned to parse and follow all the way through. And I really think it comes from Tom's background. The other thing is this sense he has of how much is lost. So he obviously knew, and I'll tell you in a minute how we found it out, but he obviously knew that his whole family had been killed because he'd never met anybody related to him. And he came from a big family and he never really wanted to ask. And his mother never really said, but his plays are suffused with this sense of loss, the loss of culture, the loss of artists, the way artists have been killed, the way books have been burned. So for example, his most famous play, Arcadia, I'm sure you know Arcadia, Thomasina says to her tutor, oh, Septimus, can you bear it? All the lost plays of the Athenians, 200 at least by Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, thousands of poems, Aristotle's own library brought to Egypt by the noodles ancestors. How can we sleep for grief? And Septimus says, by counting our stock. We shed as we pick up like travelers who must carry everything in their arms and what we let fall will be picked up by those who are left behind. The procession is very long and life is very short. We die on the march, but since there is nothing outside the march, there's nothing lost to it. When I read, um, you've probably read it, Amos Elan's beautiful book, um, you know, about the 
Jewish intellectuals between the wars, I just, this just rang to me, this sense that he carried with him, that something that was his heartbeat and his cultural heritage was just gone. Um, and I think it's, be, you know, he has that sense in everything, in the invention of love, he has young Houseman, another divided character, speak to his older self saying, have you ever seen a cornfield after the reaping laid flat to stubble and here and there unaccountably miraculously spared a few stalks still upright? Why those? There's no reason. Avis Medea, the Thyestes of Various, the lost Eschylus trilogy of the Trojan War gathered to oblivion in sheaves. So, you know, I think Tom always felt that his contribution to the world was somehow to hold on to culture, to hold on to that sense that everything was not lost. Then much later in his life, um, he meets Václav Havel. He goes to Prague for Charter 77. He becomes very involved in that liberation movement. And one night at the hotel, a girl comes knocking on the door called Sarka, and she's the daughter of his father's boss at the shoe factory. And she says to him, uh, Mr. Strassler, Stoppard, um, uh, I knew your father. And she puts out her wrist and she had a scar because she'd walked through a glass door as a child and his father had stitched it. He was the surgeon. And Tom says he touched that scar and that all the grief of his history sort of came back to him. So it's, I mean, it makes me cry to think about it because you know, he just didn't know. So he finally sits down with this girl and his mother and he says, what happened? You have to tell me. Well, of course, it turns out that both his maternal and paternal grandparents died in Auschwitz almost immediately after they, fact, they left. Um, and then all of the other relatives, Auschwitz, Auschwitz, Treblinka, like this. It's just astonishing. And he feels absolutely devastated and also humiliated because he has gone around his whole life telling everybody what a charmed life he's led. And he has, he's led a fantastic life. He has beautiful children, he's rich and famous, he writes beautiful plays, but suddenly this cat caught up to him. So his last play, which is on in London right now is called Leopoldstadt. You've seen it? And, oh, wonderful. So I just saw it now because it came back and here's the really strange thing. And this sort of makes, me go full circle and why I wrote this book. My mother fled Vienna March 15th, 1938. And she's a literary critic um, and has written on everything. But in more recent years, she's written a lot on Wittgenstein and on the diaspora Austrian uh, writers like Joseph Roth and Canetti. And uh, she wrote a very brilliant memoir called The Vienna Paradox about her escape and her arrival in America. And Tom Stoppard loves this book so weirdly. There's a lot of it in Leopoldstadt because he always displaces. So it's not about, it's his Jewish play, but it's not about his family. I was longing for him to write the play about his mother. What a play that would be because she's so in denial and so complicated, but he didn't want to write that. So he writes a play about an enormous intellectual Jewish family with a matriarch looking at a, at a photo album in the beginning. And it goes through all the generations from the early 19th century, all the way through Hitler. And the last, and it's, you know, very upsetting what happens to them. And there are lots of debates about Zionism versus assimilation. And, you know, they're part of, um, uh, you know, they are like most many Viennese Jews, they were sort of central to intellectual life in Vienna. Uh, Herman says to Ludwig, we literally worship culture when we make money. That's what the money is for, to put it at the beating heart of Viennese culture. At the end of the play, the Tom Stoppard character finally appears. And it is the story of the scar. So it's so amazing. This goes back to the voice of the art writer, you know. He's the least confessional person you've ever met, Tom Stafford. He's shy, he never talks about himself. He's quite funny, he's warm, but he keeps his distance. And suddenly this story of the scar comes up. So this boy turns up in Vienna in 1956 called Leonard Chamberlain, who nay Leopold Rosenbaum. And that little boy who we see as a child in the play has broken a cup the day the Nazis arrive in his parents' apartment and cut his wrist. So he comes back, he finds himself in Vienna and he meets his relatives. There are only two left. One woman has been in New York and comes back and one has stayed. 
And he can't figure out sort of what's happened to them. And he's quite cavalier about the whole thing. And she is so devastated. She launches into him and she says, you act as if you cast no shadow, that you have no history, but nobody is born at eight years old. And this is who you are. And you have to know, you have to know, you have to reckon with it, that that, if you don't reckon with your origin story, you will never have a future. Who are you? Um, and uh, it's quite an amazing thing to put about yourself in a play. I thought it was such a condemnation of his, of his own myopia. Um, uh, I would have cast it very differently than they did it in London, but someday I'll do it and then I can cast it the way I want. So, um, and that brought me full circle sort of back to, to, to Pinterest. So I'll just end with... Um, I pair Leopold Stadt in my book with a Pinter play, one of the only ones I've never directed that I long to direct called No Man's Land, which is about two old guys who've been in the war. One's a poet and one is, you don't know what he is, Hearst. But it's that intense thing. And I'm sure Pinter was thinking about the war and thinking about the loss of 6 million Jews and, and the loss of all of that. And he says to Spooner, I might even show you my photograph album. You might even see a face in it, which might remind you of your own, of what you once were. You might see the faces of others in shadow or cheeks of others turning or jaws or backs of necks or eyes dark under hats, which might remind you of others whom you once knew, whom you thought long dead, but from whom you will still receive a sidelong glance if you can face the good ghost. And he mesmerizes Spooner with this image of the dead caught in chains or imprisoned in glass jars, longing to be set free by the memory of a living person. And finally he says, and so I say to you, tender the dead as you yourself, as you would yourself be tendered now in what you would describe as your life. And I think uh, and that's sort of a beautiful description on Pinter's part of the journey that Stoppard has also had um, in his playwriting career. And then in a sense at age 83 in Leopoldstadt, I'd be curious to know if you agree with me, that is sort of what he's doing. There's an attempt to tender the dead and um, as he himself would be tendered in this life as he would describe it as his life. So, that's, I'm gonna end it there. <laughs> uh, is that about half an hour? Yeah, but that's just a little chapter. That's chapter two of, sort of chapter two of the book. So it comes out February 25th, 2020. You can order it. You can pre-order it right now on the dreaded Amazon or on Bloomsbury Methuen's own website. That's probably the better thing to do. Um, Cause mostly, it's a lot about the secrets in the room, just meaning what did I find out from them, like these kind of things, but also much more kind of um, mundane and technical, but hilariously funny things about how to make the plays work. Pinter plays are like magic tricks. They look really simple and like they have terrifying things like somebody tearing a newspaper into strips, but what it takes to actually make a newspaper that will do that and then put a mic up a guy's sleeve so that the sound of the tearing will come to the back of the house. These are the things that make Pinter incredibly uh, difficult and complicated to do. So a lot of it is, are those journeys as well. And, um, you know, think little tricks they gave me along the way. You know, he thinks, I mean, it's enormous, right? You saw it, it's 30 people. Um, it's gonna go for a month to Toronto. So he's happy about that. It will probably uh, land briefly in New York, you know, in that production. And then hopefully it will have American productions. I mean, interestingly, I think it would be, it would fare quite differently in America and maybe be easier. You know, I felt there were parts of the play that were so over-explained as if there was nobody Jewish in the audience who'd ever seen a Seder or ever knew, do you know what I mean? And I think we could be a little more nimble about it because a lot of the audience would recognize it, do you know? Um, having said that, I mean, I thought the audience was sort of stunned by it at the end because I think a lot of people sort of have forgotten that history or don't know that it's his history, do you know? 
Yeah. The last act is his story. And so you kind of have to wait for that, right? Did you find that? Yeah. Mm. A lot about Stafford seems to be there, and then it doesn't really cohere. Right. I agree with you. I mean, I was laughing because uh, one of the things I write about a lot in the book um, is that he's a great collaborator, and he will make a bespoke version for you of whatever you, or at least he did for me. Pinter, only once in my whole time watching him work and whatever, did he ever change a line. I mean, Pinter's plays are meticulous and he can listen to his plays and close his eyes. And after the run through go, you're missing a pause there and there. And that silence was too short. I mean, that's the ear he had for rhythm. Stoppard was quite different. And the second time we did Indian in Ink, we re he rewrote the whole ending because we didn't really think the ending worked and he didn't either. And he, was, he loved rewriting. He was happy to sit in rehearsal, tweak a line, cut a line, change a line. And I think, I wish I could get in the room with him with Leopold Stein because <laughs> I think maybe I could get a little more of him in there. Um, I also think there's a way to do the doubling so that you carry the history of those characters through in a way that's not so confusing, maybe which is also a tricky thing in such a huge cast, you know? So I don't know, I'd be really curious. I mean, it was so heartbreaking for me because it really was sort of my mother's story. And my mother just turned 90, talk about weird identity crises or whatever. And she and I and my daughter went to Vienna in June and were given our citizenship back which I thought was the most upsetting, disturbing thing. And she thought was fabulous. And my daughter was completely nonplussed and didn't. <laughs> it was, I, I just looked at those people giving it and I thought, you took everything away from us and now we should be grateful to you? We wanna be Austrian? What? I felt, I was found the whole thing incredibly upsetting and she found it, a complete vindication of everything that had happened, that she was back there in the Leopold Museum, speaking German, giving this beautiful, wonderful um, acceptance speech. And do you know what the award was? An Iron Cross. I kid you not. You couldn't make that up. You couldn't make it up, right? Well, there was a painting. We didn't, their family didn't own a Klimt. There was a painting that came up that they were offered and it was a very complicated thing and it ended up getting sold. No, and they didn't really pursue it. And um, I think it's why I found it so upsetting. It's certainly not the first time I'd been in Vienna. I did a Steve Reich opera there and stuff, but we stood in the courtyard of number six, Hurlgasse, which was her house. And she said, very matter of factly, so these are the stairs that we went down on that date because if we take in the elevator, the concierge was a Nazi and she uh, would have reported us, you know? And, it, and you look at this beautiful apartment and you imagine the library they had, the books they had, the everything, all the family papers, everything. For what, you know? So I didn't find it at all, anything about it, but whatever, I guess it's better better to welcome people back than not, you know, but but that's why I think the Stoppard thing is so moving to me because it's a, it's a strange reckoning. There is no right or wrong way to do it. And I could go on and on about it with him, but the fact that he is a playwright that deeply investigates the past and secrets about the past and identity and people's hidden identity and philosophy and science and everything, and yet knew so little about himself. And, you know, he married a Jewish woman, his second wife, Miriam, Jewish woman. Her parents lived on the estate that they lived on. They celebrated Shabbat. Like, what world did his children think they were growing up in? I mean, these are all the mysteries to me that I just, you know, never could ask. And so when Hermione Lee's biography came out, which just came out this year, 900 pages of it, uh, she found amazing material because Tom gave her all the letters he'd written to his mother. So it's really interesting. What's the distinction? Yeah, it's a great question. So I would say um, 
and these are my definitions. You know, naturalism is this fake theatrical style that we have, that we think if you put it on stage or on television, it makes people look natural, right? So um, it is uh, somebody having a dialogue, but lighting a cigarette while they're also drinking a cup of coffee and walking across the room naturally and casually to open a window. Do you know what I mean? And it looks like sort of television behavior. It looks like behavior that feels natural that you'd recognize. Realism to me, the reason I call Pinter realism is emotionally, it is, and character wise, it is not the least bit abstract. It is utterly precise. The behavior, if he said, you know, cobalt blue, it has to be that blue. It's not sort of, well, today I'm gonna to put the actors in light blue. It doesn't work. It's sort of meticulous how people behave, but he dispenses with this trope of naturalism, which he thinks is a lie. And that is the knowability of somebody's past. So Pinter doesn't believe that. And actually, I can read you a wonderful quote about this in his famous speech writing for the theater. He says, apart from any other consideration, we are faced with the immense difficulty, if not the impossibility, of verifying the past. I don't mean merely years ago, but yesterday, this morning. What took place? What was the nature of what took place? What happened? If one can speak of the difficulty of knowing what in fact took place yesterday, one can, I think, treat the present in the same way. What's happening now? We won't know until tomorrow or six months time. And we won't know then, we'll have forgotten or our imagination will have attributed quite false characteristics to today. A moment is sucked away and distorted often even at the time of its birth. So he doesn't pretend to know things like, like you do in Tennessee Williams where you know everything about Stella and who she was in love with and whatever, what Belle Rev looked like. It's not naturalistic that way. The reality is when two people confront each other, a kind of intense, visceral, real engagement happens. You can spend a lot of time saying, did Goldberg know, know Stanley? Why is he terrorizing him? Was Stanley really a musician? Those questions don't get you anywhere in Pinter. They're just not worth asking. What you have to ask is, what is the encounter in this moment? If Stanley is holding on to his persona as a musician, how does that make him vulnerable to Goldberg's attack? Which of course it does completely. So it's a very different way to think about character, but it isn't to say that those characters are abstract. When Pinter was in rehearsal, if you said to him a real question, like why does Meg keep asking Petey to read the newspaper? to her every morning. What does it say about their relationship? He would pause and think about it. And then he'd say, I believe she's forgotten how to read. And that's such a great note. It's not a psychological note. It's a playable note, which is, oh, how humiliating. I'd love to know the gossip in the paper. I have no idea how to get it. PT, would you, you read me out some nice bits yesterday. And then the actor isn't burdened with this thing of, is this a bad marriage? What is it? You know what I mean? And in Stoppard, it's very much like that too. You have to trust in some way the live present tense encounter on the, on the page. And Tom would sit in rehearsal and say to the actors, don't set it up. If the love affair comes in act three, let it surprise the audience. Don't set it up. Now, of course, in American theater, if you go to drama school in America, what you learn is to create an arc of a character because that's what Arthur Miller does. So you start at the beginning of the play, so does O'Neill, right? And you build the journey of your character from innocence to experience or whatever, so that at the end, when that detonates, it feels plotted. Neither Stoppard or Pinter would ever uh, permit that. They don't believe that. Stoppard is interested in reversal. He's interested in the moment when a human being who's going this way surprises you and goes this way. He thinks people are filled with contradictions. And so it always frustrated him when the actors were doing their American psychology bit. That sort of drove him nuts, you know, because he'd want, he'd want it to just suddenly ambush the audience that there's a love affair. Oh, it's them. Oh, we thought the love affair was gonna be these two people, but it's these two people. That's what he loved, that theatricality, you know? So he would sit there and correct us a lot and tell us how to say, pronounce all the words. Very pissed.
No, I did, crazily enough, I did a revival of the birthday party and it hadn't been revived in New York since its first production. And um, I just adored it. And it was this amazing company. It was David Strathairn and Peter Riegert and Gene Stapleton. You remember Gene Stapleton? And so he sent... He was he wouldn't give the rights because he thought Americans were not funny and they were too psychological and they'd ruin the play. And I kept ringing his agent and saying, you know, I married a British guy and he has a good sense of humor and I'll make it. Don't worry. And it won't be too heavy and it won't be this. And then Tony Harrison, this British playwright I'd worked with, went to tell him that I was good. And <laughs> so we finally got the rights and he sent Betty Bacall to see it because that was his friend. And she came to opening night. And I had this baby. I have a picture of Lexi, my Lexi, who's now 30, in, in the dressing room and Betty Bacall coming and kissing the baby. And Betty Bacall wrote him and said, oh, Harold, you would have loved it. It's such a shame that you didn't see it. It was really, it was great. And I think it was true to the spirit of the play. You would have liked it. So he said, he called me and said, would you come and meet me, which I did in London. And uh, that was the beginning of a lot of, he loved long lunches with a lot of alcohol. And then he'd written this new play and he couldn't figure out what to do with it because it was only 20 minutes long. So he said, what if you revived the birthday party and did it with Mountain Language and I would come and work with you? And I said, sure. And so then he came and was in the room with us. And you know, I had heard he was a nightmare. And I'd also heard from women that he was really misogynistic. And um, I absolutely did not find this to be the case. And I just want to say that because, you know, the readers for my book, you know, when you send in a book and you get readers reports, two of the readers said, well, I, we don't believe at all. We think she's much too Pollyannish about Pinter because we don't believe that he was, you know, we heard that he was violent and horrible. And all I can tell you is he was totally extraordinary in the room. He was incredibly respectful of me, which was for no reason at all. I had no track record. I was 27 years old. I had a baby in the dressing room. It was CSC. We had no heat. I mean, this was not a great gig. You know, he was Harold Pinter. He must have been 60 by then. I mean, he'd seen major success in every capital of the world, but he just loved rehearsal. And that's what I loved about him. As long as the work was good, it didn't matter. And he had a bottle of wine the whole time from 10 a.m. You'd say, do you want something to drink? And he'd say, no, 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 just um, Chardonnay. You know, and then it was there, but it meant that um, he just loved to work and he, and he was happy to answer any question. And he really believed the actors were his tribe. And um, it was the most amazing experience. And, and I learned everything. And then I did a lot of his plays and he would just, you know, I'd call and say, I don't understand this section or I, I don't know what to make of this or and then we would work together and the tragedy that's in the book is that we were going to do a big Pinter festival 9-11 and we were doing the American premiere of his play celebration and he and Antonia were at the airport ready to come when we were going to do this whole thing and then 9-11 happened and because he was so antipathetic to Bush and the whole Bush doctrine he just couldn't come to America. He thought it was force measure and he, and he thought it was a tragedy, but he thought the response was terrifying. He already saw the surveillance state happening, you know, um, and, and he wrote the most beautiful letter about why he couldn't come, which I put in the book and then I couldn't put it in because his letters haven't been published and you're not allowed to print them, which I think is really too bad because his letters were extraordinary and they would give a whole generation a way into doing his plays. So I hope if the Pinter gods are listening, that they'll be published. I could do excerpts in my book. I have all the Tom Stoppard letters complete because he was great, but you can't publish Pinter. Yeah. That time at CSC, he was there every day. Every day, all day. No, I loved it. I don't, I, you know what? I look back at it and I think, do you all have this feeling that you were much braver and more interesting when you were much younger than you would be now. I, I feel, I feel like now, if that happened, I, I, I would probably be paralyzed. I don't know why I wasn't paralyzed. I was completely sleep deprived because I had this baby and I hadn't sort of organized childcare. Thank God she slept all the time. Um, he doesn't, didn't like children and his agent kept ringing saying, have you had that child yet? And I kept saying, don't worry, Judy, it's all going to be fine. And so I didn't want the baby to get in the way and I didn't want whatever. And I wanted to be really professional, you know, but, um, no, I thought he was fabulous because he was so engaged. I'll, I'll give you an example. There's a moment in the birthday party where in order to terrorize Stanley, they snap his glasses, which is like somebody's bone snapping, except that it isn't because if you buy a pair of glasses at 
by right or whatever, they don't snap. This is a magic trick that is immensely difficult to do. And if they don't, the, mo mo the moment is over. It is not an abstract moment, it is visceral. And one day David Strathairn came in and said, I've solved it. And he sawed his glasses in half, drilled a hole, put a toothpick in and glued them. And then he sat in rehearsal. So when it snapped, you'd hear the toothpick. Well, Harold Pinter thought this was like the best thing that ever happened. I mean, he said, because he was agonizing about what were we going to do about the toothpick? And then he was agonizing because it was CSC, it was a thrust stage. And so we had to show the staircase, but he wrote for a proscenium stage, so you never saw the staircase. So he kept thinking, this feels naked somehow that these actors are going up the stairs, but it's so much fun to watch. What do I do? So that's the only time he changed the line. One day he said, Peter, to Riegert, I wonder if you might add a line for me. And Riegert is like shaking, thinking, oh my God, Harold Pinter's writing a line for me. And he's on the staircase. And Rieger's like, yeah, Harold, Harold, what do you want? And Peter said, I wonder if you could just turn around and look at Meg and say, what a lovely flight of stairs. So that was his line. <laughs> because the upstairs in Pinter is always where rape and pillage happens. It's like, you don't go upstairs. So he just smiled and said, what a lovely flight of stairs. So we had such a good time with him in the room. And I've always had an incredibly good time with Stoppard in the room. Stoppard is different because he was never an actor. So he doesn't give acting notes the way that Pinter did. Pinter was a genius actor and a great director. So he would give a playable note. You know, like I'd say, something's wrong with the party. It doesn't feel tense enough. And he'd look at it and then he'd say, I believe Irishmen always drink alone. And what he meant to say is pull McCann away. It's too convivial. Put him alone on the other side of the room, this hulking Irishman, and then it'll be scary. So his notes were really specific. Tom's notes were more intellectual always or language-based because he's so he's embarrassed to talk about feelings. He will do it. And I have a whole chapter in my book about a time I made him do it for a play called Rock and Roll. And I have all the faxes that he sent me. Remember faxes? He would handwrite in his Waterman fountain pen and send me 10 faxes. And I put them all in the book because it was agony for him to explain a very simple thing that he could have just said about a character in Rock and Roll. It's not logical, Carrie. He's a broken man from childhood, but he didn't say that. He tried to explain everything else and I couldn't figure out how to make this work. And then he said, so, but he was always a pleasure in the room. And I will say most writers are not, and I could certainly name David Mamet being one of them, writers that you would not choose to have a long and happy rehearsal relationship with. And because I was a woman, many, many writers who treated me like the maid, which was what I expected, you know, because I was young, but also female, uh, that I would be really denigrated by them. And, and it never happened. And so I, d I just said in the book, I'm not going to write this because actually this was my, my experience was one of complete collegiality for whatever reason. And so uh, it was really, that was a gift and, a, and rare. I kept thinking the Americans I knew, men particularly of that age, completely the opposite. So who knows? Yeah. So you mentioned several times now that you have been working with directors, who are working with writers, they're there with you in rehearsal, and they change something. Mm. They write something, they mm -mm. change the ending. Yeah. What becomes of those oh, such a good question, David. What happens is his publisher, Stoppard's publisher, loses their collective mind because here's how play publishing works. In England, if, it, if you're Tom Stoppard, there is a rehearsal script that gets published before opening night so that the audience can buy the script. Well, that's, of course, ludicrous because everything gets changed in rehearsal. One of the differences between the British system and ours is we workshop plays to death. They don't workshop plays. So often Tom will go into rehearsal with the Coast of Utopia, a nine hour play, and he's never heard it before. Leopold Stott, he had sat around the table with Patrick Marber and his wife, and they read it. That's it. He'd never heard it with actors. So in rehearsal, he rewrites all the time. So you buy the script. And then you're thinking, excuse me, what? Because it doesn't add up and often he's made a lot of cuts. That's the first published version. Then there's usually a second printing, which is his mad rewrite after it's run and he figures it out. Then 
he'll come and like we did. So we did Indian Ink, we did the American premiere in 1996, 1998, the year he won the Oscar for Shakespeare in Love. And then we did it again in 2015 in, in New York at the roundabout and, and, and we rewrote the ending. So, and it's so much better. So he went back to his publisher and said, well, next time you, you know, go back to the well, if you're gonna go into, you know, if you're gonna publish it again, here's the ending. And sometimes that works and sometimes not. And um, Hapgood, which is another wonderful one about Russian spy and collusion and Heisenberg, um, Jack O'Brien did it at Lincoln Center and really fixed one part of the play that just had never worked before. But you still can't get it unless you write Ankitani or the drama check at Lincoln Center and say, hey, do you have that version? And then I realized something funny. Tom loves manuscripts and he loves lost manuscripts and found manuscripts and philology. And he wrote a whole play about it that's called The Invention of Love, which is about A.E. Hausman, who was a great philologist who would spend, you know, his entire career looking for the lost parchment of Propertius. So I think Tom thinks it's hilarious that there are these manuscripts of his and there's nothing definitive. And he doesn't feel it has to be definitive. You know, he doesn't have that... I mean, I don't want to say ego because he certainly has a healthy ego, but he feels that theater is an iterative event, that a play is just a blueprint for production, that it doesn't exist as a real thing until it's produced. And so he doesn't sweat it. I sweat it. And particularly because I want other people to do that better version. And when I'm doing his plays, like we did The Hard Problem, which is not a great play of his, but it has a real hole in the middle, he solved the time frame. And so I wanted to say to other theaters doing it, hey, you can reverse that scene and the play will make sense, but whatever. Then I thought, well, they'll find it or they won't. I know it's kind of surreal. I mean, it will change as the, as the definitive texts get published again. And, but you know, it goes back to Shakespeare. Shakespeare never published any of his works. When the folios were finally published, it wasn't his scripts. They were actor prompt scripts. The actors who had more lines you know, held on to their scripts longer. And so their things were missing in Shakespeare because we never got the scripts. It wasn't considered important. It's weird. I'm curious how your experience with these two people yeah. relates to the hundreds of other plays that you've done. Because in the first half, you said, you look for the spine of the play. And in the case of these people, the spine lay in these kind of repressed or reworked personal experiences mm -hmm. that have been lost or found again through writing. Is that something you believe about all people you work with or just these people? Like I'm thinking <laughs> about Shakespeare and I'm thinking, well, there's somebody whose personality seems very far behind a set of myths or a set of stories or it's yeah. So how do you find that? In every rehearsal, do you look for this same thing, or is there other ways of approaching other plays? I mean, look. Obviously, when you're doing a classical play, you don't get Sophocles in the room. I'm working in the Oedipus cycle right now, and boy, I wish I could channel him. Um, and ask about the ending of Colonus, which I still don't understand. But so, you know, there are people who are very suspicious about authorial intent, and I understand that. It's, you know, sometimes a writer will say what they intended and it has nothing to do with what's on the page. So there's an enormous disconnect um, between sometimes what a writer will say that their personal connection is to the work and what you see in it. But, but well, here's what never changes, Andy. I think the way you find the voice, I'm sure this is true in music, let's say if for a conductor, you have to do a deep dive into everything that person wrote. Do you know what I mean? So for example, like I've done a lot of work on Beckett. When I first worked on Beckett, I believed what Martin Neslin told me at Stanford, you know, it's absurd, it's cycle, it's, it's existential, it's whatever. Then the Beckett letters came, and I read everything. I read the novels, I read, I read the plays, I tried to figure out how do I do these? Then the letters of Beckett came out. And you discovered what Beckett did during the war, which is he was in a trench in uh, southern France in the red clay country, running code for the resistance. And suddenly you reread Waiting for Godot and you think, well, it's complete realism, which is what Jan Kott said. You know, in Poland, when we want fantasy, we do Brecht. When we want realism, we do Beckett. And I thought, oh, that's what that means. So now I'm working on Sophocles. So I'm thinking, the Oedipus cycle is written over the course of 40 years. 440 BC, he writes Antigone. Then he writes 20 years later, 
Oedipus Tyrannus. And then as he's 90 and exiled from Athens, he writes Colonus. So what do we make of it? And, and here's what I've learned. You have to go inside the world that generated those plays. You have to think, what was the zeitgeist, right? What did it feel like to walk the streets of Athens in 440 BC? What were the conflicts? What was the religion? What did he believe? You know, and, and um, there's a man in despair. At the end of his life, he sees democracy and collapse. He's exiled. His son thinks he's senile. So he has to recite a verse of his own play to show that he's compass mentis. And the end of the play is nobody lament for me. The earth is going to open up and I am going to walk into the bowels of the earth. And you think, what is that? What is that? But the more, so you dig around in anything that's tangential, and certainly with Shakespeare, we don't have first person accounts of Shakespeare, but we have amazing amounts of material. Let us say, I just did Merchant of Venice. There is brilliant material written on what was the nature of anti-Semitism in who were the Jews, were there Jews after 1290 in Britain? What would Shakespeare have experienced? What about the conversos? And then you realize, of course, Merchant of Venice isn't really about just about Judaism, it's about hiding your faith because Protestants were turning into Catholics. Very hard to tell the difference. So that made everybody really nervous. So in a way, that's what the play is about. So you can find it. No play is abstract. I guess that's what I realized. Even the most abstract seeming, there is a kind of, you know, zeitgeist that finds its way into the stage. And human behavior has to be real. There is no such thing as abstract human behavior. You know, as Balanchine said, you put a man and woman on stage, it's a love story. I mean, something real has to happen. Um, if you have the privilege of meeting the writer, there's a shortcut into the inner universe of the play. If you don't, you look for anything. Sometimes you look at movies they were watching or music they listened to or, um, you know, just hints of, of um you know, like now all this amazing stuff has come out, for example, about the music Proust was listening to when he wrote A La Recherche. And that is so fantastic because I don't know anything as David will tell you, I'm a musical illiterate. And so to realize that that little sonata that, that makes Swan fall in love with Odette isn't something abstract that he dreamed up, but is really right from a Chopin piece or a Satie piece that he heard. You know, sometimes you find those things out hundreds of years later. You so must find yourself very much at odds with the currents around us. I mean, yes. I see a lot of theater and almost all opera that I ever attend where the whole point is to destroy precisely that either in the interest of saying something about our times or in the interest of saying something that the yeah. director wants to say. But, but I mean, why do you think we're there? Because we have lost any value of art that isn't instrumental. And I think that is a disaster and it's the end of art. Art should never be instrumental. Art isn't responsible to anything other than itself. And if it's true to itself, it will speak to its time because artists live in the zeitgeist. We live in this universe. We are in the middle of an incredible climate cataclysm and political polarization and racism and blah, blah, blah. We live inside those contradictions. The meeting of reality with imagination is what makes art. When you get rid of the imagination of the artist and all you have left is reality, then you should just go be a journalist. That is my opinion. So I'm not interested in art that tells me what to think, however righteous it is, and even if its point of view is correct. It's just, it's not art. Why would I, why do I wanna sit through something? Why, I mean, it's just, it, it doesn't do the very thing art can do, which is subvert, defamiliarize, as Viktor Shklovsky would say, defamiliarize your reality and in doing so, suddenly make you see in an entirely new way. And that's what Aristotle was writing about, you know, I mean, anagnorisis, recognition for a character, but recognition for an audience member that looks at someone like Medea, never having been someone who wants to kill her children and recognizes what that feels like. And then you can say, this is what happens to immigrant women who are treated as barbarians by their partner, because that's what the play is about. I don't have to set it 
in Bosnia and hit the audience over the head that this is a, a play about immigrants in order for that to emerge. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's not to say I've done a lot of modern dress productions and you can set a play anywhere you want if it's interesting, if it's resonant, but not if it's reductive. So I always start from the point of view that the playwright is much more brilliant than I am. It's not, why do a great play if you think you're the one to get up there? I feel the same way about opera, which is not to say it should be done in period because after all, Shakespeare wasn't done in period. Shakespeare was all done in modern dress. Shakespeare would have laughed at the thought, you know, of doing Julius Caesar in a toga and his time Julius Caesar was done in the clothes that his people uh, lived and worked in. So they all knew that was a play about Queen Elizabeth. They didn't have to be told that. And I think it goes to the question of metaphor. You know, to me, theater is metaphor. You have real life and you have the imagination of the artist and the metaphor the artist creates, creates a piece of art that can resonate such that you can relate to your own experience, but you also see it builds a bridge to that pastime. And I guess it's why I've never directed American realism. It just doesn't interest me. <laughs> because it doesn't interest me. It's not that America doesn't interest me and what we're living through doesn't interest me, but it has to be displaced or defamiliarized somehow. This is why, you know, Stoppard will probably think I'm insane to think that the identity crisis in Indian ink has anything to do with him being Jewish. And in a literal way, it doesn't, but it just gave me a meta, it's a metaphor for his own divided self. And I, I think we have to fight for that. I think we have to fight again for art to, to create kind of empathy and imagination in a public that is devoid of it, rather than saying that art is there to make a point or further polarize or tell people what to think, you know, or be good for you in any way. And that's why I don't believe in trigger warnings, forgive me, you know, because I think we should be triggered. You know, it isn't safe. You go see Medea, it's unbelievably upsetting if it's well done because in our heart of hearts, we all have felt that kind of rage. And that's terrifying to recognize, to recognize violence in yourself or do you know what I mean? We don't wanna think we're like that, but when you see a great play, you feel those feelings, you feel lust, you feel jealousy, you feel desire, you feel com competition, uh, you feel loss, and, and so you're changed. And that's what theater can do, I think. So I think we're in a really terrible moment and I hope we pass through it quickly to the other side. <laughs> you know, I just try and entertain myself. I mean, that's why I wrote this book, I thought, this is not gonna be a moment when Tom Stoppard and Harold Pinter are gonna see their work in the American theater, not for a long time. This is not gonna happen. Pin Stoppards are too expensive and Pinters are too polarizing. Um, and also, you know, well, whatever, it's gonna be a while. And I thought, so I wanna honor that and, and know that they're great plays and that they will live in some happy future. That's a good note, right? <laughs> okay, thank you.